Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 209, we're going to talk about microphones. Well, specifically, we're going to talk about valve microphones. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Well, great sound is our one and only goal at Valves and More and Melatone Amps. But great sound has to have a source, preferably a great sounding source. And that brings us to today's topic, valve microphones. Now, probably the most famous valve mic ever made was the Neumann U47, first introduced in 1949. And even if you haven't heard of the U47, you've almost certainly heard of some of the main, many famous performances recorded using the U47, including those by Frank Sinatra, the Beatles, and many more. Now, I wish we had a U47 to show you, and maybe someday we will. But for now, we'll just have to make do with a Rode K2 valve condenser. So, not all condenser mics are valve mics. But what is a condenser mic, and what in the heck is the tube used for? Well, we've got a nice little diagram here for you. So, if we've got a singer here, we've got, we've got sound waves coming here. And um, we've got a very, very simple depiction of a condenser mic in which I've just shown the... Um, the capsule, that's what picks up the sound. I have, I've omitted all the electronics, the valve, everything. <laughs> so we've got a very, very thin membrane on the outside and we've got a solid fixed um, uh, plate on the inside. That has a current passing through it. Yeah, now what happens is this starts to move as the uh, pressure gradients change. So your sound waves are basically changes in pressure gradient. And um, this will pick up a very, very low signal as a result. And um, at that point, we've gone from analog on this side to electrical on this side. Now, it, you might say, Jim, uh, you got two plates really close to each other. That's starting to look like a capacitor. And what's the... What's the old, old name for a capacitor? Uh, condenser. Ah, so yeah. now everybody knows why they're called condensers. I guess if they were invented in modern times, it would be called a capacitor microphone. <laughs> condenser Wait. sounds a lot cooler. It does, doesn't it? So no wonder nobody has changed the name. Now, you've got a, probably a fairly long cable run from the microphone back to, let's say, your mixer. So you might have 20, 60 or more feet to go and a very low signal. We're talking millivolts here. So that's not going to be very easy to move through a cable. So what you do is you apply gain to that or amplify that signal. And you can do that with solid state electronics. And I'll show you a solid state condenser mic in a second. Or you can do it with a tube. A tube. Or, yeah. or even a pair of tubes. And if you existed before there were solid state electronics to amplify, it was all tubes if you wanted to do the amplification. Well, mostly. I actually brought out from my cl mic collection um, a... I guess it would be called a passive mic. Yeah, well, it's a ribbon mic. In fact, the CR14 is a dual ribbon mic. And there's enough of a signal coming off of here that we don't need to have... Um, a tube inside of here or phantom power applied, we can work with the signal coming off of the ribbon. And over here we have the Rode NT1, and this is a solid state condenser microphone. But the main event is um, this Rode K2, and let me just carefully... Mm -hmm. Now, what are the what are the three rules of uh, handling a microphone, Charles? Uh -huh. Don't drop it, don't drop it, and don't drop it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, don't drop your microphone. <laughs> or get it wet. <laughs> Especially if you've got uh, high voltage electronics in it. <laughs> yeah. So here you go. So what you've got here is 
the pickup side, the capsules inside of here. In fact, let me see if I can get that. I'm going to try to get that so you can just see it. It's tough unless the right can lighting is the there. Right and I'm not going to take it apart just to show you. Anyways, there's a, there's a capsule in there. It's really tough to see through that mesh. And you can, of course, see that the tube is actually backed up almost as close as it can possibly get up to essentially your pickup. And the reason for that is they want to keep these these leads, these very low voltage leads, as short as possible before they amplify the signal. So, and there's, I th I've seen mics with a back-to-back -back pair of tubes in them. Um, the, there's, actually, Charles has got a whole selection of mic tubes to show off um, that are really fascinating. So, why don't we clear the decks here, and mm -hmm. we'll come back and uh, Charles will show you some tubes. Okay, well we've got a whole selection here of different tubes, including something really neat on the end here that we'll take a look in a bit. Now some of these tubes are used for all kinds of things, and some of these tubes are more dedicated for simply handling... Um, Very low signals, yeah. Yeah, like you would see uh, in a microphone. Mm -hmm. So what we have over here first is the 6AQ8, also known as the ECC85. And everybody's probably going to recognize that ECC with an 8 on it because the ECC81, 82, and 83 are some of the most commonly used dual triodes that are out there. And this is in the same family. So we've, you can see we've got these two plates in here. And I believe we have the exact same pinout on this guy, although I'll have to double check that. And we have some versions of these that are made by RFT and uh, and a few other manufacturers. They're they're pretty interesting. It's a um, it's what you would consider to be a medium U dual triode these days, although it's in the high medium U, so in the 30 to 40 range. Yeah, and to put that into comparison, um, a 12 AU7 has a mu of 27. Oh no, no, it's around 20. 20. Oh, yeah. I'm way up. <laughs> Next, we have a beautiful Brimar tube, and this is the EF86. And you can see somebody has been helpful and actually put the American designation, the 6CF8, on the box here. Oh, show the other side here. Yeah. So, BVA is the British Valve Association, and look what they called it. It's a thermionic valve. Thermionic valve. Well, which that's is, what they were. It's what it is. <laughs> and this is a voltage amplifying pentode. And this is a beautiful Brimar example. I, I found a couple of these while I was searching for tubes for this show. And um, this is just great. It says that it was made in Holland, although interestingly, I don't see any Philips tube codes on here. And well, Brimar wasn't part of the Philips family, so yeah. that's making it even more interesting. And Brimar stands for British Made American. Um, so <laughs> I think what they did was, uh, I, and, and again you can correct me on this. I think they started in in the, around the Second World War, and they started with um, American designs, mm -hmm. and, and then later on they branched out quite a bit. In fact, in the UK, Brimar was the uh, number one competitor to Mullard, and they're quite prized tubes. In fact, um, up until uh, now, we really haven't focused much on tubes for microphones, and um, uh, we have quite a few uh, new old stock vintage tubes that are specifically microphone tubes that we really, we need to get out of our yeah our dead inventory. <laughs> yeah, and some, some good used ones too. So we're actually going to create a section in the store that's specifically for some microphones. Some of these microphone tubes, yeah. yeah. Or ones that are best suited for microphones or used for them. So over here we've got one of our favorite 12AX7s and this should be no surprise to anybody. It's a dual high gain triode. It's used all over the place for amplifying very low signals. And, and it's a Matsushita. Which and, is one of our favorites. And uh, I don't think we've ever come across a Matsushita um, that we didn't like. Yeah, they make great tubes. Or I should say they made great tubes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. unfortunately. Like almost all great vintage tube manufacturers, they're gone. Mm -hmm. And so far, nobody's actually bought up the rights to the name. Well, Matsushita is still in business as a, yeah. as a company. So nobody can make uh, modern production versions of them. And this is an interesting one right here. This is actually closely related to that 12AX7 because this is a 12AY7. 
This is again one of those other designation names. So 6072A is supposed to be a higher spec version of the 12A Y7. And I see stars on it. Yeah, is that one is, of the five star GEs? This is one of the five star GEs. So it's it's more robust. It's better built. We have a few different versions of these. Some of them with triple micas on them as well. And these are chunky looking plates on here too. And this is uh, this is one of those in between tubes. So it's not quite the same gain as a 12AX7 or I think a 12AT7, but okay. it's more than something like a 6DJA. Yeah, can you hold those stars up so people can see what they look like? Yeah. So a lot of tube manufacturers starting sometime in the 1960s um, really wanted to try to differentiate um, some higher spec uh, lines and tubes from their competition. And GE went with, uh, with what they called their five star line. And these were supposed to be the best of the best. Yep. Now, selected, better built, extra support posts. I think in some cases they were just simply selected off the line for better better performance qualities. Uh, but in in some cases, uh, they actually physically tried to build a better tube. Mm -hmm. So that's always something to watch out for. Um, uh, some of it is just simply advertising BS, uh, but often um, because tubes were really a serious business, and there was a lot of competition, and there was a lot of competition, um, you you know you could advertise the goods, but in, at the end of the day, you really needed to deliver the goods as well. <laughs> yep, yep. And last one we've got here is a sixty nine twenty two. This is a Sylvania made. Phillips branded tube, another dual tryout, another one that's sort of high medium U. And we've got some beautiful examples of these late production ones here. We got really lucky and we found a large lot of them. Um, and I think the boxes were what, dated 1980 to 82, something yeah, like that? Yeah, they were all in the 80s range, all um, military production white boxed ones and branded Phillips in Sylvania. Yeah, so that. When you see a Phillips on top of a Sylvania tube, uh, Phillips, uh, bought, they bought out oh, I, I probably a th at least a third of the world's manufacturing by the time that the second tube era came to an end around 1982-83. And they, they purchased Sylvania about 1980, so they, but they kept Sylvania's uh, main tube uh, manufacturing going for a little while. Uh, mostly to meet military contracts. That's why you see uh, late production Sylvanias that have survived new old stock to this day are, yeah. are mostly um, uh, U.S. Pentagon surplus tubes. Yep, you'll find them white boxed, military boxed, things like that. And they, they are great tubes. Um, so that was quite a lucky find. All right, we've got one more to look at here. That's not a tube, is it? Yeah, this is a really interesting tube because this is... A telefunken and it's going to be really hard to make that out on there here let me turn that around there's that telefunken diamond and while this isn't the tube that went into the is it Newman or Neumann? Neumann. Neumann U47 this is actually on the same platform and basing structure so it had this interesting sort of octal center pin but it had this odd arrangement of pins around it I think the U47 started with a tube like that, but I think they they changed um, at least once a couple of years after the initial introduction. Mm -hmm. And they're, the modern production one, I think it's called the U47E, uses a completely different tube. I think it actually uses um, the 6072 in it. But sh just look at the size difference here between this and that, and think about how big those old microphones must have been to fit something oh, they like were, this. <laughs> oh, they were massive, just absolutely massive. I mean, I can remember as a kid watching uh, some of the big singing groups from uh, the Second World War era who made it onto film in the 1950s, uh, groups like the Pointer Sisters. And they would be singing into these microphones that were almost as big as their heads. <laughs> now, they were petite young ladies, but my goodness, those, those mics. Those were big were, mics. Those were big mics. And they are worth some serious money today, let me tell oh, you. Oh, I bet. Well, yeah. thank you for digging out all those tubes. I know you actually love any excuse to go to our, our back inventory, which is 
absolutely massive. Yeah, and find some interesting stuff and pull it out. I'm always amazed at just how many of these things we actually find. I mean, the I didn't think we had any EF86s and I found these beautiful primers there, so. Yeah, so I think you need to get going with the tester. Yeah, get them tested, get them in the store. Um, I guess we'll put up a nice little microphone section in the main tube area and, and anything that doesn't already have a section where it belongs will probably end up going in there. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks for doing that. And I think you've got a, a couple of nice tubes that came in that we want to take a look at. Yeah, so let's uh, clear the deck and we'll be right back. So it's actually been a fairly slow week for uh, tubes coming in, um, though we did get one huge box of tubes. Yeah. Um, but ne next week, hopefully, we're, we've got some real treasures coming in. Yeah, um, some stuff that we don't or aren't able to normally stock, uh, and some stuff that is very high demand. So. Yeah, br <laughs> brown. I'm going to give one hint: brown bases, but not very many. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, and rectifiers. <laughs> oh yeah, you you found some rectifiers that are in very high demand. Yeah, yeah. It's, you don't, don't get any points for guessing which one it is. So everybody should know by now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so we managed to actually get together some nice looking, well, better than nice looking, some great looking Sylvania 6 cg 7s These are the later box plate version, not the earlier black plate version that we already had in the store. And I think almost everybody knows that a 6 cg 7 is the uh, direct a nine pin, miniature nine pin replacement for a 6SN7. You yep. just need an adapter. We carry the correct adapters in the store. I might even have one sitting here. Let me see. Oh yeah, I do have one. Yep, that's all it takes. And you can drop this into a 6SN7 slot. And these are great sounding tubes. They have that classic Sylvania sound, uh, closer to the later version 6SN7s than the earlier ones, of course, considering that these were made and, much, much later. And we've been selling a lot of 6C, this year we've sold a lot of 6CG7s and it's very close cousin, the 6GU7. Yep. Um, and an incredible number, we get orders for adapters and no tubes, which is, we which is kind of interesting. Well, people are finding cheap tubes elsewhere and that's fine. Yeah, more power to them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it just, it, it's amazing. It just takes our universal um, 6 or 12 SN7 uh, kit preamp and it just changes the sonics of it completely yeah and there's just so many more tubes that you can roll it's uh, it's amazing if you if you like tube rolling branching out of the nine pins gives you so many more options yeah and it explains why the universal kit preamp is our best seller by far in fact we sell more of those kits than i think all the other kits combined yeah and people get back to us and say oh my god i love rolling <laughs> well the, the first thing they do after they buy the buy the kit and maybe a pair of really nice tubes to go in it is buy like six more so yep. Yep. anyways okay so we just looked at this guy here that's one of those great 6922s which of course is a 6 dj8 equivalent and on top of getting some really nice close matched ones here whenever we did get this big lot in we also have some in that aren't quite as nicely matched and they're not bad tubes they're either new old stock or used, depending on which ones we have in the store there. And they're testing good, but they aren't tightly matched enough that you can have, you know, one channel running on each side and have them uh, sound even. But if you have a tube mic or a piece of equipment that uses one amplification stage into the other, these are actually really good tubes for that. So we're going to take the mismatched ones and pop them into the microphone section as well. Yeah, and they'll be, of course, heavily discounted. Uh, now, there's some provisios here. Some circuits might have two gain stages in a row, which would probably be fine. But if you've got, uh, let's say, a matched pair of, of tube mics, and um, you're going to use them as a stereo pair, you're going to want to have the tubes themselves matched. Yeah, and you can still do that with the sections mismatched on the tube itself. You just have to let us know. We'll make sure the two first sections and two second sections are matched as they should be. And the other thing that I think a lot of people don't really understand is that the 6922 is a 6DG8. It's essentially a later iteration of the 6DG8 and the tubes are basically interchangeable. Occasionally you'll see people making notes saying that, oh, you can only use a 6922. And maybe in a few circuits that's, that's true. They're pushing it right to the edge of what its specs allow for, maybe. Yeah, yeah. but basically the 6922 is a 
slightly better 6DJ8. Um, and this is an interesting box. I mean, that's really why I wanted to show this. And that's because it's got one of the latest dates that we've ever seen from the second tube era. Because most plants by 1982, 83 had shut down. So this might just be a boxing date. And in fact, the tubes were made in 1982 or 83. It's hard to tell. But look how how late production this is. It's actually got a barcode. <laughs> you don't see that too often on no, production tubes. No. So anyways, these are great tubes. And we got really lucky. We found a whole lot of these. So good matches are still possible. And we found a huge pile of one used. of our favorite 6SN7s. Yeah, GEs. For a while there, we haven't been finding any of these. And we were lucky enough to find a whole bunch of them that are used and very good looking. And uh, that's my job for the weekend is to get these tested and in the store. <laughs> yeah, and they came in from a tube seller we've done business with for years who's just an excellent guy. And um, he, um, he stands behind his product. And one of the biggest problems we've got right now is that almost everything available wholesale is basically junk. It's been picked over or, you know, somebody already knows that it's garbage and they're trying to get some value out of it. That is really common. So be very careful, folks. Um, you can get some indications if a tube is junk, particularly the power tube, by looking at the gettering. Now, the G is, is a fairly unique 6SN7 because it's got a side getter. Mm -hmm. Some RCA tubes do as well, and there are a few other odds and ends out there that do this, but mostly if you see a side getter, it's a GE or an RCA. But it doesn't matter. So the chrome is here on the side, or it's on the top, or it's on the waist. Those are the three basic locations. And um, there's some little variations in which you can have double getters on the top, middle, or or on both sides even in some cases. Yeah, on both sides, even on larger tubes. But look at the gettering. If the gettering is fading away, particularly with power tubes, this of course is a voltage gain tube, um, but if the, if the chrome domes are not really solid, or you can see a line of fading away. Or you see a white line. A uh, white line, yeah. well, a white line, a big white line means that the tube's almost done completely. But sometimes the gettering will just sort of fade away without leaving much of an impression of what it was. So if you know what a new old stock tube looks like, and what the gettering looks like, that'll give you a good idea of what kind of hours are on there. I would say, what, about 90% of all power tubes for sale these days, vintage power tubes, are... They're, they're, you can tell that they, they're done. They've just been run to death and the gettering is gone. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think last year we bought a large lot of really nice power tubes from a gentleman and they were all done. They, yeah. Every tube in the box was done. Yeah. Well, he was one of the ones that showed the, the four tubes in the picture that actually looked like they might have been decent and said yeah. the rest were like that. So yeah. it was a little bit of a struggle to get our money back. Yeah. But anyways, eventually we did. <laughs> so, well, thanks for showing that, Charles. If you stayed to the very end, here's some discount codes to help you out. And um, we're getting a lot of larger orders in and people have been taking advantage of a secret code that's really easy to grab and um, we can reach almost everyone around the world with flat rate $20 shipping but if your order is $150 or more after discount the shipping is on us folks stay safe everyone this is Jim and Charles signing off cheers everyone